Hey guys, I couldn't wait. I wanted to see what goes on with the dog, so I'm going to read chapter 11. It's only after I lie back down on the couch that night. Oh, that's right. He sleeps on the, on the couch. That's his bedroom. That night I realized that what all I've done. To Ma and Dad, one thing. Ma's still awake and I can see the light in the bedroom as Dad goes and his dad goes on down the hall. And then I hear their voices. Not all of what they say, they say, but enough. Ray, told you I just found out about that dog myself. Secrets for me, you and Marty. Till tomorrow, I would have told you then. Every day, the mail to Judd's place mentioned that dog to me. And all the time, up on my property, me not even know him. So those are just like bits and pieces of what I guess he's hearing. I bring my arms up against my ears and hold them there. So many things going wrong, it's hard to remember anything going right. Doc Murphy knows I've got Judd's dog now. Doc, Dad's mad at Mom, and we won't know till tomorrow if Shiloh's even going to make it. Worst of all, I brought Shiloh here to keep him from being hurt, and what that German Shepherd's done to him is probably worse than anything Judd Travers would have brought himself to do, short of shooting him anyways. This time, when the tears come again, I don't even fight. I don't even try holding him back. I must have slept through Dad's going off Dad's going off to work the next morning because when I wake, Becky's standing beside the couch eating a piece of honey toast and breathing on my face. Sometimes I'm glad I'm an only child. <sighs> Daryl Lynn's already told her about the dog because she asks right off, Where's it at, that doggy? I sit up and I tell her that the dog's at Doc Murphy's and we'll find out how he is that afternoon. Then I look in the kitchen at Ma. There's the set look about the lips that means trouble that means don't mess with her because she's already in trouble with dad i go outside i pick me a couple of wormy peaches woo, and sit on the stoop eating at them spitting out the wormy places or we could just not eat it Blah. daryl Ann comes out and sits beside me today she's all kindness Judd travers don't take care of his dog marty no wonder it come up here she says trying to make the say the right thing I can tell she's been figuring it all out. And from what I, she could overhear between Ma and Dad and anything else Ma told her. I take another bite of peach. It wasn't like you stole him, she says. That dog come up here on its own. Just hush up, dear Lynn, I say. Which I had no business saying. I didn't want to talk to anyone at all. Well, you could have told me and I wouldn't have told anyone. Thanks. Ma says we got to give him back to Judd when he gets better. I get up and start towards the hill to clean up the ground where Shiloh was attacked and see if there's any way I can put some fence wire over the top of the pen to keep out the shepherd. What's his name, Marty? Darylin calls. Shiloh, I tell her. I'm only halfway up the hill when I hear a car and turn around. It's Miss Howard's car and David's in it. Soon she sees me. Soon as he sees me, he jumps out. It's still moving a little and he comes running towards me. I get to stay here today, he yells, waving a kite he's brought with him. Everyone else is going to Parkersburg, and I didn't want to go. I look over to where Ma and Miss Howard are talking, see Ma with nodding her head. I get lonely sometimes up at our house, but today I just want to be with that loneliness. I don't even want to talk to Daryl Lynn, to Becky, Dad, even Ma. If we had a telephone, I'd be calling Doc Murphy every hour. Let me have a phone. As it is, I have to wait until Dad comes home from work before I can find out about Shiloh. I can't go down there, pester and dog him with patience to see. What do you want to do, I asked David, trying to dig up a little bit of enthusiasm. David and I are in the same grade, and even though he's taller and heavier and looks like he's in junior high already. Try out this kite in your meadow, he says. I lead him around the long way, away from Shiloh's pen, and he doesn't even notice because he's unwrapping this kite made of silk or something, which one of his relatives brought, brought, blah, 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 brought him. We stand out in the meadow flying the kite and I watch the blue and yellow and green tail whipping around in the breeze. And I'm thinking about Shiloh's tail and the way it wags. You get a dog on your mind, it seems to fill up the whole space. Oh my goodness, my neighbor's got a friend coming with purple hair. <sighs> Everything you do reminds you of that dog. We bring the kite down later though. David sees a groundhog and next thing you know, he's after it. The groundhog zigzagging this way and that. David's yelling like crazy. I'm taking your kite back down to the house, David, I yell when I see him get near Shiloh's pen. He goes on running and yelling. I'm going to get me a handful of soda crackers. You want to make some peanut butter cracker sandwiches, I call, trying to get him to follow. And then his yelling stops. Hey, he says. I know he's found the pen, and I walk over. What's this? He looks at the blood on the ground. Hey, what happened here? He nosy. 
I let go over and I yank his arm and I make him sit down. He's looking at me bug-eyed. You listen to me, David Howard, I say. Whenever I say David Howard, he knows it's serious. I've only done it twice in my life. Once when he sat on the paper flower pot I'd made for Ma at school. And once when he saw me with my pants down in the bathroom. Because that made me really mad. <laughs> but today I'm not mad, I'm serious. Something awful and terrible happened in here, David. And if you ever tell anyone, even your Ma or Dad, may Jesus make you blind. That's the kind of talk my folks can't stand. But I got it from Grandma Preston herself. Ma says Jesus don't go around making anyone blind. But Grandma Preston always used it as a warning. And she went to church Sunday morning and evening both. David's eyes about to pop out of his head. What? He asks again. You know Judge Travers. He was murdered. No. But you know the way he's mean to his dogs. He killed one of his dogs in there. <laughs> Lord... No, let me tell it, David. You know how he's missing a dog? Yeah. Well, it come up here on its own, and I let him stay. I built him a pen and kept him secret and named him Shiloh. David stares at me and then the blood in the pen and then back at me again. Last night, I tell him, Baker's German shepherd jumped the fence and tore him up. We took Shiloh to Doc Murphy, and Judd don't know. David's mouth falls open and hangs there. Wow, he says, and then says it again. I tell David how hurt Shiloh was and how we've got to wait until tonight to see how he is. Whew. And then we go into his pen together and David helps me clean up the blood and pull up all the grass with blood stains on it and throw it over the fence into the woods. It's easier somehow with David helping. With David knowing even, if it was me by myself, I'd be thinking again and again how this never would have happened if Shiloh could have gotten away from that German shepherd. I look at David and I think, we're friends for life. And then I think of how it, there are exactly seven people now who know I have Judd Travers dog. And it's only a matter of time before somebody lets it out. Probably Becky. She'll warble it. That's warble. She'll warble it to the first person coming up the lane. Did you ever notice how more a little kid tries not to tell a secret the sooner it gets out? Nothing that child can do about it. A secret is just too big for that little kid. What I didn't expect was that at 3.30, before Dad come home, here's Doc Murphy's car chugging up the lane, and he's got Shiloh in the back seat. I'm standing out by the oak tree with David, taking turns on the back swing when I see the car and Shiloh's head raised up in the back seat. I'm over to that car in three seconds flat. Shiloh! No cry ever sounded so happy as the one that came out of my throat. All of us were crowding around the car. Ma and Daryl Lynn and Becky and David Howard and all of us are saying, Shiloh, here, boy, and holding out our hands, and Shiloh's trying to lick everything in sight. Patient recovered faster than I thought he would, Doc says, getting his big belly out from behind the steering wheel and standing up, so I figured I'd bring him on over myself. And then to Mother, had patients coming in and out today and don't know that I wanted them to see this dog. She nodded. I'm going to pay for this, Doc Murphy, I tell him. You send the bill to Dad, and he'll pay it, but I'm going to pay him. Well, son, that's a generous thing to do with the dog that's not even yours, he says. Is he all well now? No, not by a long shot. think it's going to take a couple weeks to heal, and I can't promise you he'll walk without a limp, but I got him sewn back up and full of antibiotics. If you think you can keep him quiet for a few days and off that leg, I think he'll pull through just fine. If Ma was mad at me before, she's not now. Not the way that Shiloh's licking her all over both arms, getting a quick lick at, in at her face every time she bends close. Becky's sticking her hand out for Shiloh to lick, and when he does, she squeals and pulls it back. Shiloh's tail's going crazy. It's like a welcome home party. Ma has me bring this, bring in this cardboard box from the shed and cover it, uh, and we put an old pillow in the bottom of it and cover it with a clean sheet, and Doc Murphy lays Shiloh down inside it. Shiloh seems to know he can't walk too good because as soon as he tries to stand up, he sits back down again and licks his leg. He's one of those light comb things. I'm glad Shiloh's back and I'm glad he's going to get better and that we can keep him till he's well. But the more I sit here petting his head, feeling his happiness, the more I know I can't give him up. I won't. All right, stay tuned for 12.